super excited. Have you ever wake up in the morning and you look into the mirror and you know that you are about to go out there, but there's something about you that makes you very different. So during the pandemic, I have one person, my special guest speaker, coming and reaching out to me. And he said, Michelle, there's something about us that's very similar. And when you, people say that to you, there's usually two things that they're, they're coming after. Number one is either they're a coach and they want to be my coach or they want to sell me stuff. Or the other thing would be that there's something about them that makes them very special. And today it's an honor to bring my guest, Joseph Professor, Joseph Basil here. Professor Joseph Basil, he is, has a long list of, of accomplishments and, and roles that he had played in his life. But more importantly, Joseph was born with a defect, a paralysis on the right arm. And he was basically a shy boy um, growing up. But according to his mom, he was also an entertainer. Um, the story that he has shared with me was that he would go out to the diner and he would jump onto the table and start dancing to the jukebox that's playing in the background. He experienced so much of bully as a young boy he, but even though he's physically challenged, it never changed his belief in trying out in footballs and tennis. He traveled around the world with his family, accompanied with his father, who was on the military assignments. His family eventually moved to Florida. And during his uh, high school and junior years, uh, Professor Batel discovered his interest and talents in drama, musical, theater and broadcasting. And I wonder why. Do you remember that boy dancing on the, on the table at the diner? That would be him. I can go on and on talking about how amazing he is, but I would like to have you hear from him. Welcome, Professor Joseph Faisal. Michelle, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's been so long since we connected. And one thing I wanted to really give a shout out is happy belated birthday. Thank you. I was uh, just, I just turned 72 years old. I, I was going to say that and you don't look 72. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you, that. It's a lot of makeup. Like, a lot of makeup. <laughs> you look like you are ready to take on the world. <laughs> So tell us about your journey. I, I know we had connected and you had shared about um, your birth defects and growing up and that was a struggle. But yet, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that you accomplished. Just to name a few, you were the lead singers in the rock star band, radio disc jockey, stand up comedian, professional voiceover artist, um, film producer. CEO of a film company for three years and professional tennis instructor and coach. How did you accomplish all that? What was that like? Well, accomplishments come to the fact of not just yourself, but the people around you. And I had a wonderful mother and father who encouraged me throughout my life, but I also have a wonderful supportive wife. My, her, her name is Alice. And she has always been there for me. And so I can credit a lot of that to my wife and my two sons, Marco and Matthew, that I'm so blessed to have, as well as my grandchildren and my daughter-in-laws. You know, they say it takes a village. That village has helped me achieve all of the greatness and the wonderful things that I've been able to accomplish in my life. You mm -hmm. cannot do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I think... That, that was, did you, did you realize that in the, in, the, in the very first beginning in terms of, yeah, I need all these people to help me to go through this journey. What was it like when you, you were a child? What was it like growing up with a disability? Yeah, that was pretty difficult because children just don't understand differences. And I was different. On the playground, for example, because of my paralysis, I couldn't join in a lot of games. Like nobody wants to play Red Rover, Red Rover with a guy that can't hold your hand. So the kids would basically say, 
uh, put him on the end or we don't want to hold his hand because it looked funny. The hand just is, you know, because it's deformed. So it looked funny. And so they felt I was different. So they didn't want to be, me to be a part of them. So, but I was a nice kid and I was quiet. I wasn't mean to anybody. But a lot of times the teacher did not want to have conflict. So she'd let me just go sit in the grass. And I, during PE or whatever it was called and I wouldn't be able to participate. So that was hard because I was lonely. I was by myself. Yeah. And you need people and you need people to grow. And that was hard on me. And so that, that would hurt my feelings, but I wouldn't get angry. I would get kind of disappointed in, in the way they treated me, but I didn't get mad at people. I didn't get mad at people. You, you know, um, the uh, listeners or viewer, those of you who haven't met Joseph before, Joseph is this most amazing and generous pe person I have known. Um, we get a kind of, we got onto the call and it was a, a short connection call and he was so kind and you cannot imagine him being being angry or being mad at somebody so as you're describing it you know you that that view of you being so generous and kind it just popped into my head I'm like yeah there's no way that Joseph could be uh, angry or towards be mad towards anybody <laughs> My students will disagree with you that I taught in high school. I'm sure there were times that I became very intense and sometimes I became angry, I think. Sometimes it was on purpose and sometimes I, I, would, I would lose my composure because I wanted them to be so successful and to work hard because I know how hard I had to work. And sometimes that came across, I think, as, as anger but I loved them so much. I wanted them to be successful. And I think as they became adults, they understood that personality just yeah. a little bit more. When they were younger, they probably thought, ah, oh, that guy's kind of mean sometimes. And uh, so none of us are perfect. So that's gonna come across whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. And we have to work on those things. So I've had to work on, I've had to work on those things in my life. But mm -hmm. generosity, I think as you get older, you become more compassionate. You become more kind, more, more considerate, more compassionate. But I have my moments. You can ask my wife. I have my moments where I'm, I'm, I'm not always the happy guy. And so we have to work on that in life. It's something we have to work on every day, I think. We can't ever get satisfied with who we are. We have to try to work harder and harder every day on who we are. How did you, how did you discover who you are? I think I discovered who I was through looking at other people. When other people noticed my talents and my abilities, and it was just a quick story I'll tell you, is that how I got into the rock band, for example. It's when I was shy and quiet, but I used to impersonate like different singers that I would listen to. And one of my friends who played guitar or whatever had a rock band. And he says, have you ever thought about singing in a rock band and be the lead singer. I said, what? No. So he said, well, come try out or whatever. So I came and I could imitate all kinds of different singers. So I kind of said, who was your favorite? Elvis Presley. And that, <laughs> he was my and favorite. <laughs> yeah, he was my favorite and I still do his impression. But I could imitate like these rock singers a little bit and try to sound like them. So they said, well, let's try House of the Rising Sun or whatever by the song. And I would try to impersonate how that vocalist sounded. And the band went, oh my gosh, you're great. Will you join our band? And that's it. And once people started recognizing, I think my talents and my gifts, I call them my gifts, mm -hmm. then my paralysis, my handicap was not a problem because they didn't worry about it. So I didn't worry about it. That's where I think I started identifying who I was and not not my handicap, that's not who I am. That's basically what I was born with and that's not gonna change. Were, were, you, were you conscious um, about that paralysis when uh, how people were treating you before they discovered your, your talent? A little bit too much. Sometimes to the point that I try to hide it, you know, wear a long shirt or, you know, do something. Cause there's quite a few scars from the surgeries that I've had to have. So I was a little embarrassed about it, but I got to the point that it was just me. It's just who I am. Yeah. And my students, many of them, 
when I was in high school, didn't notice it. And I would bring it up and they go, oh, Mr. Bates, wait, we've never noticed that before. So I think if you have some kind of handicap or, or some, I don't know, some, some problem that you think is physical, just go ahead and accept who you are and let that shine and not worry about the handicap and the disability. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Yeah, I, I think what you brought up is uh, what comes up for me is you, you and I have this uh, physical disability or physical handicap, right? There, there are people, uh, millions and billions of people walking around and, and perhaps they have some form of handicap or a disability that we are, we're not seeing. It's not apparent from the outside. It's, it's more of a, um, a defect on the inside and that they're walking around just like all of us, just like you and I, right? With that physical differences. But th th maybe they can hide it away. They can put it away. They can pretend it's not here. But for you, you can't put it away. You can put it away and consciously as a, as a kid, as a child. So you're walking around with the arm paralyzed and no one wants to hold you, hold your hand playing the game. How was other kids treating you? Well, as I got older, I became a little more confident. And I think I was always kind of a nice kid. I think in my yearbooks, I've read where the kids would say, oh, you're such a nice person. I'm glad I got to know you. Oh, you're so nice. So that was kind of the word they would use, nice guy. And that's okay. And so I think that because I tried to be a nice person and be kind, I think they didn't worry about it anymore. I, I grew out of it. Let's put it that way. I grew out of it. I love how you grew out of it. <laughs> yeah, I grew out of it. Uh, so, so you went from um, when they discover you, your voice, your vocal talents, and you start moving into entertainment industry. Right. What was that journey like being in the entertainment industry? Well, the entertainment industry is very dog eat dog. And so you have to have a very tough skin. You have to be able to understand what it's like to be disappointed because you're not gonna get every part. You're not gonna be able to receive all those accolades. Not everybody is a Brad Pitt. Not everybody is an Angelina Jolie. And you have to realize where you fit in the puzzle. And once you learn where you fit in the puzzle, then you become satisfied with your accomplishments. So maybe you've done nine movies, but they haven't been big box office films, but you've been satisfied because of the fact of what you've accomplished as an individual. And that's what you have to learn in the entertainment business. The fact of not everybody's gonna love you, not everybody's gonna hate you, but you've got to put yourself out there and say, here's my talent. Here's what I have to offer. And that's what you have to learn early on, or you will not be successful. Mm -hmm. I think mean, one of the things that, um, that you had, when we had the discussion, it was, there are three priorities in your life. And, and as we're talking about, you know, cultivating all these skills and just have developing that tough skin, what came up is that, um, so the three of your priorities are faith, family, and career. And as we're talking about all these journey as a, as a child growing up with disability, and then later your talent got discovered, you went into the entertainment business, and then now here you are. Um, I think what keeps surfacing up is that faith and having faith or having hope for the future. What is faith for you? Faith is the idea of believing in yourself and believing in others. Because with, without that, you basically don't have anything to drive you, you know, forward. Faith also gives you hope. And I don't care if you're religious or not religious, it doesn't matter. But especially in this pandemic, if you don't have faith and hope, then basically what you do is become a little bit defensive. You also become depressed. And then all of a sudden, you know, then you can have a downward spiral a little bit in your, in your thoughts and your feelings. And 
So you've got to you've got to keep faith somewhere. I don't care where it is, and go along with faith is hope. And then it sounds a little biblical. Then comes charity, which is why I want to give a, a plug for the organization that I belong to, which is the LDS PMA organization, where we try to promote good Christian values and principles in our organization, and we promote publishing and media as far as the areas that we want to have people improve and have instruction. That's why I'm the education director. That's my goal and my objectives with my board of directors. And I just love that because it allows us to teach those values and principles and to somehow get that across to other people and make them feel more confident about their writing, about their publishing, and all the type of, you're doing media right now and you're doing good media because you're trying to promote goodness. There's too much negativity in the world and we need to move away from that and move into a positive aspects. So join organizations that are positive, that will uplift you, make you a better person so that you wanna share your gifts and talents with others. That would be my advice to people. Mm -hmm. But, but I think, um, you know, during this pandemic, a lot of people have lost hope, right? There are people who are sitting at home and they may be at the edge of losing a job or, or losing, losing that st steady income. How, how is it possible to even have the slightest hope of what the future could bring us? What, how can we possibly having that faith in believing that this is something that was good for us okay first thing i would recommend is this lean on your family bring your family around you and make them a part of that faith and hope talk about it talk about what's going on make sure you have open type of discussions now if you lost your job i know that's really difficult and i have a friend who's a little bit older and he's out of a job but he's every day looking for a different job, but not just that, Michelle. What I love about him is he's being creative and creating his own ideas. Like he's forming his own website. He's forming his own place for people to go ahead and do audio books and do reviews for books. Don't sit idle, reach out. You've got to be proactive. Today with this pandemic, be proactive. Use, use your networking. There's people out there that will hire you. You use the, the technology we have. Mm -hmm. See what's available. Find something in your talent, your ability, and make it work for you. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. And then I think um, when we are in that space of, you know, this is happening, I'm losing my job, I don't have any money coming up, and how can I possibly think about being, doing something creative? I can't do that. And when we're so focusing on, you know, what we don't have, you know, that disability that we have, then we can't go anywhere. That disability become us, right? Get, get rid of the phrase, I can't, and go with the phrase, I can, right? When I do my podcast, mm -hmm. what I find out is this, and you do as well, ordinary people, do extraordinary things. And when I listen to people on my podcast that just seem like my neighbor, and I find out what they've achieved in life because they go with, I can do something instead of I can't. Because if you keep telling yourself mentally, I can't, then eventually you won't. But if you say I can, that pushes you forward, not backward. You can, you can use every excuse. My dad told me this when I had my handicap. Mm -hmm. Sat me down one day and he was the coolest guy in the whole world. He wasn't well-educated, but he said to me, son, nobody is gonna feel sorry for you because of what's happened to you. So don't feel sorry for yourself. It was great advice. He was, he was a great guy and he had, you know, he just had the common sense in life. I had to learn everything on his own in the military, but I had so much respect. And mom was the same way. Mom would kind of say, she babied me a little bit too much, I think, because of my paralysis, 
but she also was the one that was the entertainer. And by her, her example, I wanted to be like her. I wanted to be an entertainer. She was a professional singer. And I, and, and I just loved and respected her so much. And my, my little sister, she's eight years younger. As she became older, she became a big fan of me and is today. And I love her, her name is Jackie. And I hope she's you know, gonna watch this. But I was surrounded by great people. I think if I would have been surrounded by a lot of negativity, Michelle, I don't think I would, I won't be, I wouldn't be talking to you today. I don't think I would, I would. I think I would have been that shy little man instead of a little boy. I really do. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, I, I also believe that, you know, the connectivity, the, the people that we surround ourselves with, it's really plays a big role in how we, the kind of person we become. Right, so so if we keep becoming, you know, feeling sorry for ourselves and just, you know, because you said it perfectly, there's no one else who's going to feel sorry about about ourselves. Only us would feel sorry for ourselves. So if we keep surrounding ourselves with people with dramas and negativity, then that negativity will just come keep attracting to us. So, but if on the opposite, we surround ourselves with more positivity, with people who actually are very inspiring and doing out there to do good, then chances are that is what we're attracted to. That's what, who we are. And I love what you said about ordinary people do extraordinary things. You what? know, I, yeah. I was just gonna explain this real quick. Yes, There's yes. a difference between sympathy, feeling sorry for someone and empathy, meaning, meaning you understand their situation. It's okay to have empathy for people like myself and yourself, but don't sympathize. Don't, don't feel sorry for us because that's who we are. We've accepted it. Now, empathy means that you've accepted it as well, yet you understand it. Empathy, no sympathy. Most people that are in wheelchairs don't want sympathy, but they want empathy. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I was going to ask you, the ordinary people do extraordinary things. What are some of the extraordinary things? What do we need to do? Well, I've got a podcast that's coming up. His name is Jared Kwan. And he's a prolific writer and an author and a leader. And it just goes on and on. But he couldn't read or write to the fourth grade. And now he's a published author and he's a a speaker, and he, and he was a president of a huge writing organization that had been in existence for 80 some years. But he's, he was persistent in that. And he talks about that in, in the podcast, how persistent he was. And he had to have a teacher, a mentor, who cared enough to help him. But then his first story he wrote was in the fourth grade, when he finally learned how to read and write. I love that. Just ordinary guy, right? Ordinary guy. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. And another person I interviewed, uh, her name's Caroline, and she had a chance to become a huge broadcaster in one of the, the TV stations that we have here in Utah. And she turned it down to become a mom and raise her kids. That's extraordinary. Just an ordinary little gal that I had in junior high in my drama program. And now, you know, and she's still prolific. She, she wrote a children's book here just recently. That's extraordinary. Yeah. And the list goes on and on. You're extraordinary on what you've accomplished. We've got we've to learn that inside of us. All of us have something that we have to offer, find what it is and share it. What, what, do you, what do you think it's blocking people from actually recognizing there's something inside? Don't, they don't believe in themselves. You have to believe in yourself. Everybody has a story. Everybody has something to offer. Whether you believe it or not, in religion, the higher power, it came from somewhere, your gift, find what it is, find whatever it is, writing, reading. I don't care if it's being kind to people. 
and then use that gift and share it with the world. Start out on Facebook. I don't care whatever it is. Start on a blog, write a blog about your experience. I had a friend that just passed away. We've been friends for over 43 years, but he was so, he was a professional actor and performed years and years in soap operas, but he didn't talk about that. He talked about his faith, how much he loved people in his last, last four and a half years. He taught me to be, to be more compassionate and more kind because we don't know how long we have on this earth. And that's, and that's, once you're gone, you're gone, but your memory lives on. What do you want people to remember? That you didn't do anything? That you didn't help anybody? That you didn't care about anybody? You don't want people to remember that about you. Even if you were kind, that's a gift. Being kind is a gift. Being compassionate is a gift. It doesn't have to be a talent. What's your, what's your legacy now? Because this is something that we just tapped into, right? And you have talked about your, your podcast. Uh, what's your podcast called? So everyone, everyone can go check it out. Podcast is How Did I Get Here? 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 Meaning, how did you accomplish from A to Z? That's what we talk about. If you can summarize, how did you get here in just one word? How did you get here? My faith. Strictly my faith. I believe in a higher power. People don't believe in it, that's their business, but I do. I think without that, I would have not achieved anything, nothing. My faith. And your faith is called God, right? It, for me, it is. Yeah. My faith is called God. Other people, you don't believe, that's fine, you know? We, we're going to have diversity in this world, and I'm fine with that. As long as you respect me, I'll respect you. And, and it's, it's kind of like an elephant in the room, you know, for some people, I like to call the higher power God. So that's called it out. That's called yeah. his name, right? Yeah. But yeah. for other people, if you want to call the higher power, the Buddha, then that's called it out. Let's say Buddha. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing it's wrong with that. <laughs> it's our right. perception of what's going on in the world. And right. I, if you were to teach someone, if there's one important message, because you, you just celebrated your second, uh, 70, 72nd year's birthday, um, happy belated birthday again. If you were to summarize everything that you have learned about life, and we're gonna pass it down to your student, to the viewer who's watching this right now. And it's that one very important lesson that they can walk away and be successful in their life. What would that be? Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. That's it. I'm speechless right now because it really doesn't, there's no other things that, that summarize it better than believing in yourself. Yeah, I, Michelle, there's no magic formula for happiness. Happiness is what you make it. So when you believe in yourself, you're gonna find some joy, some happiness, there's sadness in life, but believe in yourself and others will believe in you. That's what I think. Yeah. Do you still sing? I still sing. I do sing. Yeah. I still, I still get and make some little, you know, videos and stuff once in a while. Yeah. If anybody wants my Elvis Presley, they know that I can send it to them. I usually send it for Christmas. I do a Elvis Presley Christmas song and I usually send it out as a Christmas present to people. 
Well, can you do something uh, with Elvis Presley today before you call, before we wrap up today, today's show? Oh, okay. I'll just do a little bit of Elvis. <laughs> All right. Wise men sleep, only fools rush in, but I can't help falling in love with you. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> Everybody. Shell, this has been incredible. You're an incredible individual. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much for coming to the show and showing, sharing your wisdom with us. And, and I do believe the older we get, the more wisdom we have. Um, it's those journey of how did we get here, right? And, and you are doing an amazing work to share this gift, to share this charity with the people who really need to hear this. So I applaud you and, and it's been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for coming, Joseph. And thank, thank you, you everyone for watching Wednesday Live Coffee Talk. This is a show where I bring you love, courage and connection every Wednesday at eight o'clock Pacific time. So join me next week for another episode. And thank you again, Joseph, for coming to the show. Thank you.